Well, I'm going to read from Mark chapter 11, the first 11 verses. The triumphal entry, Mark chapter 11. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street. And they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Morning, Water Dam. Happy Palm Sunday. Happy, thank you. Thank you. One of you. I, you know, I want to say thank you to our, our cafe team. If we could just give them another round of applause. <laughs> you, I don't know if you got some of that French toast, but that French toast is unbelievable. And the eggs uh, and bacon and ham and I'm making myself hungry. We could go back for a second breakfast. But you can't fall asleep now, so I see you nodding off. You know, you've had a big breakfast, so I hope that you enjoyed it. But one of the things I want to say is that our cafe team came in yesterday and uh, probably worked for about two hours getting prepared for today, maybe even longer. And uh, I just wanted to say we appreciate everything they do. Uh, they decorated and they prepared all the food for us. They were here early before I got here. And uh, they're down there probably cleaning up uh, s still. And so we're thankful for them. It's a great ministry. Uh, it's a blessing for our church. Um, they do more than just that. They serve funeral meals and do um, different things for us along the year. Well, I want to encourage all of you to come back and join us again next Friday, uh, our Good Friday service. Uh, we will have communion that evening. So we hope that you'll come and join us as we focus on the cross as uh, we see Jesus uh, today riding into Jerusalem, we know that one week later he'll, be, um, he'll die on the cross on Friday and be raised again. Um, and the power of the resurrection is uh, what, we're, what we're excited about today. I hope that you're excited about it because it gives hope to a lot of people. And uh, I hope it gives you hope. Uh, let's pray. Father, as we come now to uh, meet together and speak about what Jesus does on this triumphal entry on this day on Sunday, on Palm Sunday. We know that one week later, less than one week later, he'll die on the cross for our sins and they'd be raised from the grave. That is a victory, a victory over the grave that seems so permanent. And it gives us hope, Lord. And so we thank you, Lord, that millions today will celebrate Palm Sunday Jesus writing on, we have the story to tell the nations. So Lord, in the moments of our lives this week, help us to not um, take for granted this week as we think about the Passion Week of Jesus. We, we know that it has great meaning and that we should be excited about Jesus and what he offers our families and our friends, that they too can receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They can crown him as King and receive him as their priesthood where he would sacrifice his own life for our sins. And so, Lord, we thank you for that picture as we think about him raising from the grave and sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven as he advocates on our behalf. 
I pray for each one here today that they would have a sense of Christ in their life. They would be ever vigilant to try to strengthen their relationship with Jesus by reading his word and coming to know him and serving him sacrificially. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I, I know that you know that it's Palm Sunday. We gave you some palms. And uh, we are so familiar with the story that we can kind of get, get um, kind of complacent, I guess, if you want to use that word about it, uh, because we already know the story, some of us at least, or we should. We're in Mark chapter 11. And this week, from Sunday to Sunday, is the pinnacle of Jesus' ministry. And so when we think about one week, what's in a week? I mean, imagine from Sunday to Sunday what happens. But it's the culmination and the fulfillment of the Messianic prophecy of Him coming. And uh, the law and the prophets all predicted that Jesus would come and enter into the city of Jerusalem one week before Easter Sunday before his resurrection. So the triumphal entry is what kicks this week off. And it's a, a, a foreshadowing of his return. Uh, as we think about this, to give you an idea of how important this triumphal entry is, I want you to see that all four Gospels um, talk about this last week. They record it. In Matthew's Gospel, chapters 21 through 28 cover the Jesus' last week. In the Gospel of Mark, Mark covers it from chapter 11 to all the way to the end to, verse six, to chapter 16. And in the Gospel of Luke, the last week of Jesus is covered from chapters 19 to 24. And then John, amazingly, John, the Gospel of John covers in chapters 12 through 21. Almost one half of the book of the Gospel of John is focused on the devoted to the Passion Week of Jesus. So we see here in Jesus' approach to Jerusalem in Mark chapter 11, verse 1, if you have your Bibles with you, you can look down there. It says, when he drew near to Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples. Now I want you to see something here by looking at this map as Jesus' course is coming from, we know that he was coming from Jericho, which is down in that plain down there at the bottom right and then all the way up into the mountains of Jerusalem. I'd like to be able to make it bigger. Hopefully you can see it. But that's why Luke records for us that Jesus went up into the hills of Jerusalem. The, the drop down to, Jer to Jericho, Jericho is 1,400 feet below sea level. Jerusalem is about 2,500 feet above sea level. So... Even though it's only about, this map says it's 20 miles. I've heard 17. I've heard 18 miles. However long it is, if you had your GPS, uh, you could probably get there from there. But one of the things that we need to notice is that this was a steep climb. It was a difficult climb between Jericho and Jerusalem. And the road wound its way up through some of the most desolate and inhospitable terrain in the world. Rugged, rugged, rocky, dry, and hot. And so as we think about Jesus, it's not only a difficult, it's a steep climb, but starting at the bottom of the Laurel Highlands, if you tried to climb all the way up, you might get an idea of what it's like. Or you could climb up to the top of Mount Washington and start at the bottom. But it's a rugged climb. Imagine starting about 20 miles outside of Pittsburgh and climbing up Mount Washington. I have three headings for you today as we think about Jesus going from Jericho to Calvary, as in this case to Jerusalem. The triumphal entry of Jesus, we're going to talk about that. Number two, the reception of the crowd and the cleansing of our lives, the cleansing of our temple, um, how we will relate it personally to ourselves as we think about Jesus. So first of all, the triumphal entry of Jesus. It said there that he was drawing near to Jerusalem and that he sent two of his disciples to retrieve a donkey. Now, if you're with Jesus and you've been hanging out with Jesus, you've been walking everywhere you go, and this has never been a request. So it's kind of strange that all of a sudden, Jesus wants a donkey. Why in the world would Jesus want a donkey? Jesus had walked for miles with his disciples all around this area, and suddenly he says, hey, I need you two to go in to the hill district. 
Well, not the Hill District. If you were in Pittsburgh, he would say, to the Hill District. And you're going to see a, 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 a bike leaning against the pole, and it'll be tied up to the pole. It's, it's a brand new bike. It's never been ridden. And I want you to untie the bike and bring it with me, with you. Bring it back to me. And he said, if they bother you, if they, anyone says anything to you, you can just tell them the Lord sent you. Now, first of all, if you're in the Hill District, if you know anything about the Hill District, you're going to be worried about going into the Hill District, first of all. And secondly, you know that if you start untying somebody's bike, they might come out of that house and have a problem with what you do. But he tells you, he goes, don't worry about it. He says, you can just tell them the Lord sent you. The Lord needs it. You know, Jesus, you know, Jesus, he walk, you know, he's walking. We've been walking with him. That's kind of what he tells them. We notice we don't want to write it off as just some kind of a cultural thing that, oh, they don't care about their donkey. They do care about their donkey, and they did question him, and we'll see that later. But I want you to notice, first of all, that Jesus is going into that city publicly. It's the public entry of Jesus. He did not do it by dark or by night in disguise. He was more than willing to be seen. He came riding in on a donkey. He's basically presenting himself to the public's eye. He never sought that out before. Now he's saying, no, I'm publicly proclaiming I am the Messiah. And so secondly, I want you to notice that Jesus' entry is planned and purposeful. We know that from Mark 11, 2 through 6. But before that, I want you to turn back, if you will, into Mark chapter 10, because Jesus tells his disciples right before this happens that why he's going into the city. He says in verse 32 in Mark chapter 10, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid, and taking the twelve again. So he huddles up his disciples, he takes the twelve, and he says, I need to tell you what's going to happen. And so he huddles them up, he begins to tell them what's going to happen. Verse 33, he says, see, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him, they will spit on him, and flog him, and kill him, and after three days, he will rise. That's where it stops. And so we see Jesus is on this path, and they're talking to Jesus, and can you imagine what they would be going through as he explained all this? And so they, they are dealing with the fact that he's telling them, but it's almost like they moved past it in, in that he was, you know, talking to them about him actually going in to the city and, and dying. So he has a plan and he has a purpose. The plan is to go in and die. And the purpose is to save men and women from their sins. In John chapter 12, verse 23, Jesus says why he was moving this direction. It says, my hour has come. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And it's just outside the city of Jerusalem, and he understands very well of what he's getting himself into in Matthew chapter 23, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. So he basically knows he's a wanted man. He knows, he knows he's going to die. The city has a reputation for killing the prophets, and they know he knows they're going to kill him. Jesus' triumphal entry in Jerusalem would not change only that the rest, it would change, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem would not only change Jerusalem, but it would change the rest of the world. Jesus is public, purposeful, and it's prophetic. As we look at this, Matthew tells us in this gospel, this was to take place to fulfill what the spoken was spoken by the prophet Zechariah. 
saying to the daughter Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of the beast of burden. So when Jesus had found this young donkey and he sat on it, Jesus did this both as a deliberate fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9 and a demonstration of the character of his kingdom. It was a spiritual kingdom, not a military kingdom. That he came in peace, not war, hence the donkey instead of a steed. So when we think about this and we look at these verses, let's go back to Mark chapter 11, verses 2 through 6. He tells them to go into the village in front of you and immediately as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it to me. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? The Lord has need of it and he will send it back immediately. And that's what they did. They went and found the colt right where it was located. He, he found, they found the colt where he told him to go find it. There the colt was. They start to untie it and they get confronted. And they said, the Lord has need of it. The curious, the, the Lord, the Lord of glory needs it. And they say, okay, take it. Now, it's interesting that Jesus tells them to find a donkey, a colt that's never been ridden. Uh, no one has ever sat on it. In other words, it has never been ridden or had a yoke to be used for farm work, agricultural work. That's what a beast of burden does. That's what a, a donkey does. They would have chose this. This was chosen for a specific, unique purpose. And we see and read about that in Numbers 19. If you want to go read about the red heifer that they used to sacrifice, that sacrifice had to be made outside of the temple, but it could, it had, the rabbis had made all kinds of, of uh, distinctions about that red heifer, that it had to be one that had never been ridden, never been leaned on, um, and that it had to be killed outside of the city. Notice the uh, parallel with Jesus. Jesus would be killed outside the city. But here's this donkey that's never been ridden. It's set up for a specific purpose. It's prophetically told by Jesus that it would be there, and sure enough, it was. And notice that they tell them exactly what the Lord says, and that's exactly what happens. The cult is significant because it has messianic prophecies tied to it. Jacob is dying in Genesis 49. If you want to go there and look in chapter 49 in Genesis, it says in verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute, until Shiloh, in some of your translations, comes to him, and he shall be the obedience of his peoples, binding his foal to the vine and his donkey colt to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. Now, it's interesting because the symbol of sovereignty and rule, the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes, an epitaph for the Messiah. And here it's predicted so long ago in Genesis 49, this very enigmatic statement is made. And when you read this statement in Genesis 49, 11, it's knowing that the, throughout the flow of redemptive history, this statement from Jacob that the Messiah would come through the tribe of Judah. And that's exactly where Jesus came from, from the tribe of Judah. And then you would have this statement in verse 11, somehow that there would be a donkey or a colt tied to the Messiah who would come in Genesis 49, 10 and 11. This fostered the hope of a Messiah to come from the tribe of Judah, and a donkey would be associated with it. And here we are with Christ riding in. The triumphal entry of Jesus is our Lord's intentional call to all of us to say that I am the Messiah, I am the King that you have been waiting on. Jesus came publicly and joyfully. There was nothing sad about him. He was not afraid. You notice that. He's, he takes the reception that he gets. He's not afraid of, of being hurt or harmed at this point. Jesus had a plan and a purpose. He was on a mission. His plan was to offer peace and a plan to save men from their sins. It's a triumphal entry fulfilled 
by Masonic prophecy, Messianic prophecy. The reception of the crowd is interesting. Look in verse 7. They brought the colt, they tied the, to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread their leafy branches they had cut from the fields. Uh, Jesus had intentionally avoided any kind of attention. Now, all of a sudden, he's receiving all this attention. People are taking their coats off, throwing them down on the road, cutting pines, going in and behind him, cutting it down as if to lay out the red carpet. He didn't come to declare war but he came as a witness. He came to Jerusalem knowing he was going to suffer and lay down his life, but they're excited to see him. And the donkey in conjunction with Jesus, right before this, the healing of blind Bartimaeus from the road from Jericho, right outside of Jericho, as on his way up in Mark chapter 10, he heals old blind Bartimaeus. What did blind Bartimaeus call Jesus? Son of David, son of David. Recognized him as king. And not only this, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. They started wondering if Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. So this passionate worship of Christ is seen in verses 7 through 10. In their minds, him getting on that donkey, they started screaming, it says, shouting from Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice, it says greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on the donkey, on a colt, the fall of a donkey, the foal of a donkey. It says in verse 9, those who went before him and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. They basically began to shout Psalm 118, verse 26 and verse 27. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We will bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altars. You see, Jesus is the sacrifice that will be bound to the altar. He will be tied to the horns of the altar. He will not leave that. I've always loved the quote from Begg who says, you need a whole Bible to become a whole Christian. That's why you need to read all of your Bible if you're going to understand the Bible. If you've recognized this scene, there's a scene in 2, Corinthians, or 2 Kings chapter 9. It says that when Jehu was announced to his fellow officers that this is the case, that the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel, and immediately their reactions follows. They hurried and took their cloaks and spread them upon him, and the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet, and they shouted, Jehu is king. So this, this was a president a precedent of their actions. They had heard this before. They had read it before in 2 Kings chapter 9. There was something that an extravagant response had happened when Jehu became king, marked by passion, creating, if you would, a red carpet for who comes. And we see this with Jesus. Now, I think the reason why all the people got so excited so fast goes back to John, John's gospel account of this. It says there in John chapter 12 that the crowd had been with him since he called Lazarus out of the tomb. I don't care who you are. If you see Jesus call a dead man out of the tomb, you're going to be excited about when you see him. And it says there in verse 17 of John chapter 12, the crowd that had been with him He called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. In Mark's account, he heals blind Bartimaeus. So all of these things are happening around this previous to this entrance. So they're watching and they're seeing and they're hearing and they're sifting it through the scriptures of their minds. And they begin quoting Psalm 118 and screaming and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're singing and shouting because they are excited that this, this Messiah has come. They believe he is a king. Except they had other expectations of this king. The king of Israel. They said, save us now. You remember last week we were talking about Psalm 94, how the people were crying out, save us now. The frustration of waiting and saying, how long, O Lord? Here's these people under Roman oppression. And what do they want? They want him to take out Rome. They want him to take over politically and get rid of the Roman oppression. They think he's going to start a political revolution. But Jesus does not arrive with army of soldiers, with spears. He arrives with a crowd of peasants waving palm branches. It's ironic as we see the worship of Christ and the witness of the scriptures. But then we see Christ in Luke weeping and giving warnings. Weeping over the city. He says, you do not know what would bring you peace. You see, he knows the... The people are confused. The whole city, they don't know what would bring them peace. Now peace is hidden from your eyes in Luke chapter 19, verse 42. Because you didn't know the time of your visitation. In other words, you didn't recognize when Jesus had come to you. I mean, I don't know where you were at when Jesus came to you and what what did it for you. And and sometimes we think, well, I'm not going to, I'm going to, we put all kinds of, uh, recommendations and, and, and requirements upon Jesus as if he's got to convince you. Well, he will convince you, my friend, but it's not always in the circumstances that you may or may not like. There's a story in here about a displaced pastor, um, and it says it's in Burkina Faso where pastors are targeted. And this man named Pierre was a Muslim that became a Christian. A pastor had went to his brother's house and his pastor, the pastor prayed over the brother, and the brother came back from, from being ill. And, and this, this moved Pierre in his heart. And then later on, he's married. After he becomes a Christian, his father throws him out of his house and says he won't last one week. They're in the middle of a war over there and all kinds of things. And the voice of the martyrs, pick up these pastors. There's 140 displaced pastors, including Pierre, to raise poultry, including the pastors attended a three-day course in which a Christian professor from a local agriculture college taught them how to raise chickens. This is what they survive on. Enough to eat. He has eight children in his family. Pierre uses some of the money he earns from poultry farming to purchase fuel that enables him to reach more people with the gospel. Pierre, who has nothing, literally nothing, who is raising poultry, chicken, Colonel Sanders, and here he is going out to raise money, taking some of that money to go out to share the gospel. He earns to purchase fuel which enables him to reach the people of Burkina. Using an audio Bible he received from the Voice of the Martyrs, he preaches and teaches among the refugees in the city. The people don't have anything to do, he said, so they want to listen to the Bible. Many are giving their lives to Christ. Even in the relative safety of his new location, however, Pierre still occasionally encounters Islamic militants. I don't have time to read you the entire story, but as we come here on this kind of sleepy Palm Sunday in the, in the beautiful uh, downtown suburbia of Pittsburgh, um, my hope is that you will be inspired by Pierre and hear the warnings of Christ. I don't know when Christ came to you, But Pierre should inspire us. The gospel should inspire us to tell the nations. Jesus entered into the city that day to proclaim himself as king and Messiah, but to also lay down his life. Because the people didn't know the time of their visitation, 
They did not know truly what would bring them peace. Getting rid of the Roman government was not going to help them, not with the problem that we all have, which is sin. We need a Savior. And see, this is why Jesus came. But look and notice where Jesus goes as soon as he enters into the city of the parade. Does he go into the powers, the seat of power, into the palace? No, he goes into his father's house. It says in chapter 11, verse 11, the very last verse, he entered into Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. He does not even go in and do anything at this point. He just looks around. He goes into the temple and looks around. I find that those words kind of interesting when we think about our own lives. If Jesus comes and looks around, what would he find? Would he find faith? If he looked around your room right now where you live, what would he see? Don't worry about the mess. Some of you are right now thinking, oh, I didn't do my bed. But what if, if he looked around in here, what would he see? And so as we go on here with the reception of the crowd, we're going to close just with this last scene, the cleansing of our temple, our lives. Um, Jesus goes to the temple unannounced. He just shows up. That's what I want you to see. In Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it says, The Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple without sending any immediate notice before him. He shall surprise you with a day of visitation. For he shall be like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap. So he's coming in to clean house. He wants to come into our lives. And he's coming suddenly, it says. And he will come suddenly. And that's what happened. The Lord shows up on that one day. He rides in on a donkey. And, and the peasants, you know, the Romans don't even pay attention to him. This isn't a parade. You don't have any chariots. You don't have any trumpets. You have a bunch of peasants shouting scripture. And so they pay no attention. But where does he go? He does not go to the palace. He goes into his father's house and he looks around. And then the next day he returns. And what does he say? In verse 15, what does he find in the temple? Corruption. In verse 15, it says, they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who bought in the temple and overturn out of those, I'm sorry, he began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And then in verse 16, it's interesting, it says he went, and he would not let anyone carry anything through the temple. Can you imagine that? He knocks stuff out of your hands. I mean, that's a little different than Jesus, you know, loving, meek and mild. But Jesus loves me, right? I know Jesus loves me. He, he's, I know I do all those bad things, and I know what's in my room. But after all, Jesus loves me. And here he goes into his house. Man, he's not, he's not, he's not neutral, is he? He won't even let you carry stuff through the temple. And so when we look at this and we think about what Jesus is doing, he came in suddenly and surely to cleanse that temple because he sees the, the corruption on the inside. And listen to how he talks. I mean, what do you think people were thinking? Who does this guy think he is? He thinks he's Jesus. He's the Messiah. But listen to how he talks. Verse 17, it says, He was teaching them and saying to them, it is, it, it is not written, my house, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it into a den of robbers. You see, when Jesus comes in there, he's acting like he owns the place because it is, it's his. And when we, when we ask Jesus to come into our life, he wants to come inside and he wants to own the place. He wants us to listen to him and submit ourselves to him. He wants to be king of our life. And so when you think about Jesus coming into your room, he doesn't just want to come in and look at the mess. He knows we all are a mess. He wants to cleanse the temple. And then he goes out to the outside 
and he curses the fig tree. Indicates to us that he cleanses that temple on the inside, but he curses the outside for what? Because it didn't have any fruit. And so sometimes when we get religious and we think about religious, religious is man's attempt to get to God. So we come and we go to church and we sing the songs and we think we're doing enough to get in. It's not enough. You've got to have a relationship with Christ. He has to be your Savior. He has to be Christ and King over your life. To cleanse your life of sin. You have a sin nature. I have a sin nature. He didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And so he wants to come in and cleanse us from all of the filth, the sin. The tree is cursed because it doesn't have any fruit. The presence of the leaves usually indicates the presence of fruit, but this was not the case. Jesus did two acts of judgment. He cleans the temple and he curses the fig tree because it didn't have fruit. He said the temple was a den of thieves. What's a den of thieves indicate? A den of thieves means that's where the thieves stay and hide. What kind of sin are we hiding? The room we don't want Jesus looking into. The closets of our life. And so Jesus says this is a den of thieves and he throws things down, overturns the tables, gets people out of the house and then returns again to teach. When we think about this, as we apply it to our lives, God is holy and he demands the fruit of repentance, which produces righteousness. And so how could anyone meet this standards? We must look to Jesus. The good news is that Jesus meets the standard by and through his death on the cross. He removes all the walls and barriers between us and God. And he lives inside the temple. He wants to live inside of you and me. And by the blood of the lamb, we can be cleansed of all the corruption. And he takes the curse. The Bible talks about that. It was nailed to the cross that he became cursed as anyone on a tree. He laid on the tree. His life was given up. He became the curse for us. He took our penalty and paid our debt so that we could be cleansed and that we could have life. So the fruit of repentance is righteousness and it's lifelong and trusting our life to Jesus. The story of the Bible is man placing, God, man placing himself in the place of God where God deserves to be. In rebellion and sin, man does this. And now God is coming. And Alistair Begg says he's placing himself where man is supposed to be in the place of punishment and sin. That's what happens when Jesus came in. So that from the very beginning of the Bible all the way to the end, the focus is on the way in which God will bring sinners into the perfection of heaven. How can he bring sinners into heaven? How can bad people go to heaven? The answer is the Messiah died in our place. To which the nationalistic Jew says, cursed is anyone who is hung on a tree. Yes, because upon that tree he bears the curse that God put upon sin so that all who trusted him may have righteousness imputed upon them, which is entirely undeserved. So we have to be careful. Here's the sting in the tell. 
The people thought Jesus had come to deliver them. He did. But not from Roman oppression, but from sin, sadness, and darkness. So we have to be careful that we don't get mixed up like the Jewish people and strap Jesus to our political agenda. So we have to be more like Jesus in that we look for Jesus and the gospel to restore us. Just as the Jewish people thought Jesus was coming to restore the kingdom, the Jewish nation and Rome's political power would disappointed and wrong because the gospel is that Jesus came to save humanity from their sin. And that will bring healing to the nations. Rejoice, O greatly, O daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteousness, and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will proclaim peace to the nations. He will rule and extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. Recognize him as your king. Crown him as your king and bear much fruit. We have a story to tell the nations. They shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy. A story of peace and light. A story of peace and light. No matter where God puts you, whether you're raising poultry, And just reading the Bible. May God inspire you because of Jesus to ride in to no matter where and share the gospel. Let's pray. Father God, as we come and think about Palm Sunday, inwardly cleanse us, Lord, from our corruption. Outwardly, Lord, help us to be faithful and fruitful. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to the noonday bright, and Christ's great kingdom shall come forth, the kingdom of love and light. Father, we pray for your help for each one here, that you would look into our temple and look around. And Lord, we ask you humbly to cleanse us. Cleanse us from our corruption and sin, and help us, Lord, to be fruitful and faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear the words of the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. Amen.